I have great honour now to introduce the Honourable Shane Rattenbury to speak to us on the right to repair. Shane is now a good um, friend in our right to repair journey. Um, Shane gave our plenary address at our very first Australian Right to Repair Summit last year. Shane is a passionate pioneer for right to repair, being the minister responsible in his role as Consumer Affairs Minister in the ACT to take that matter to the Treasurer and really is largely responsible for the reference to the Productivity Commission which, on the right to repair, which, for which we are forever grateful. So um, Shane is the ACT Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability, Corrections and Justice Health, Minister for Justice, Consumer Affairs and Road Safety, and Minister for Mental Health. And I would like to now hand over to Shane. Thank you once again. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Darawa Nuna, Darawa Nuna all. This is Ngunnawal country in traditional language, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to come back and see we have been able to have a second repair summit. Uh, with the way the world's been in the last couple of years, simply pulling an event off like this is quite an achievement. So congratulations on making it for a second time. We're very pleased to have you back here in Canberra. My perspective on this, as you will have picked up from that introduction, is much more theoretical than perhaps the panel... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, busy week. We've just had budget week and sitting week, so the voice is a little weary at this end of the week. As I was about to say, my perspective is much more theoretical and policy driven than the very practical conversation you've just been hearing. But this notion of a right to repair is one that we do need to build into national policy and actually create the right legal frameworks. And as was touched on, I was very pleased to have this referral go to the Productivity Commission out of the Consumer Affairs Minister's meeting. And I'll come back to where it's up to, I think. But it was a great starting point in getting the Consumer Affairs Ministers to make this referral and then getting the Treasurer to actually pro progress it to the Productivity Commission. And I think the Productivity Commission has created an excellent roadmap for us. I want to touch on a few elements of their report today. This movement really pushes against barriers and commercial strategies that limit spare part availability, proprietary fittings, unclear warranty conditions, and increasing sophistication of products. And as a Consumer Affairs Minister, who's meant to be in the corner batting for consumers, their trends that I have a really strong view that we need to push back against. Repair is increasingly recognised as an urgent response to the global waste issues that are such a critical envi uh, environmental question. And as a Greens Member of Parliament, these are things that I think about a lot. And so this is a really natural extension of how do we make the world a more sustainable place. The work that's been done so far by the Productivity Commission confirms the view that the ACT government has had for some time, and the purpose of the inquiry, in my mind, was twofold. It is about consumer rights, and it is about sustainability. And so they come together in a really nice, neat package in, the, in this whole right to repair conversation. In the way I think about it, the notion of a right to repair is quite broad, and the report done by the Productivity Commission, in my view, draws the issues out quite well. A right to repair is the ability of consumers to have their products repaired at a competitive price using a repairer of their choice and with the parts actively available. That's how I think about it. You know, I know there's variants of that thinking around, but that's, for me, really the guts of it. Now, as you can imagine, and as we well know, it's not without its challenges. It does involve a range of policies. It practically, it involves consumer and competition law, intellectual property protections, product labelling, and environmental and resource management. Manufacturers of common household goods, and in particular digital and smart goods, thank you, uh, have established unnecessary barriers, in my view, that prevent consumers from fully realising their right to have goods repaired at a competitive price. I do love the grassroots response to this. We've now got this excellent network of repair cafes uh, and men's sheds and things going here in Canberra, as I'm sure there are other parts in the country, but went along to visit one recently and you rocked up and there was someone in the corner doing electronics repair, there was textile repair, uh, there was even somebody doing, um, they were repairing a set of Christmas lights while I was there, which I thought was pretty, pretty great. But, uh, you know, we are seeing a grassroots response to that, but that's not enough. I love that that's happening and I think it's really powerful. But it can only ever touch the sides when we're against that enormous tide of manufacturer effort 
to create built-in obsolescence or purchase of more, just more and more of their product. Overall, I reckon the Productivity Commission has done a pretty good job and I support vast elements of the report. And I'm very keen to have a conversation with the incoming government as to how we move it forward. And I'll come back to the politics towards the end because it's a, it is an interesting part of the conversation. But the ideas that they've talked about through improved enforcement of consumer guarantees, uh, the introduction of alternative dispute processes, and the concept of super complaints that could be designated by, uh, well, taken forward by designated consumer groups, I think is really powerful and offer us some practical pathways that's not all of the answers, but start to put in place the pieces we need to create a comprehensive and broad sense of the right to repair. Certainly these new approaches would enable state and territory governments as regulators along, alongside the ACCC to add a further tool to our compliance armoury when we see trends in our complaints data and repetitive poor behaviour regarding those guarantees towards consumers by certain industries. Uh, to this end, the ACT has already legislated to enable the Commission for Fair Trading to utilise a new power to require businesses to attend a binding conciliation with a consumer to resolve their dispute. It's the same we actually put in place just before the Productivity Commission's report came out, but it's one of their central recommendations because of, that addresses the power imbalance. And we've put it in place for, at this stage, only products or matters up to a $5,000 threshold. So we weren't really honestly sure how it would go. And also that's where, for the consumer, it's not worth going to some of the legal mechanisms that doing this, exist now, like your, your classic small claims tribunal or civil tribunal. So the consumer's not going to lawyer up, frankly, to take on a dispute of that scale. Equally, the, the provider or the seller or the, whoever it is, the manufacturer, it's kind of easy for them to push back and so that terrible power imbalance sits there. And so this is why we've now created this binding conciliation process. And we've had the first few come through. It's taken a little while to find the examples that we could put into the system, but they've gone quite well. We've had a couple of uh, resolutions in the consumer's favour already. I, I'm literally talking a handful of cases so far, so it's small numbers, but what we've seen is that that ability of the government to say you must be involved in this to the provider has really made a significant impact uh, and brought them to the table in a way that they weren't doing before. The Productivities Commission analysis of the barriers to repair I think is important, uh, is quite informative, but also concerning, particularly the extent to which certain product manufacturers were found to use their much stronger bargaining position in the marketplace to dictate both how a consumer might seek a repair as well as, as well as encouraging them to take up new products over current versions. I support the very simple idea that consumers should be able to use an independent repairer or access the resources needed to repair a product for themselves. It's, it's kind of obvious, not controversial in this room, uh, of course. But further, as I'll touch upon at a later point, I believe this is central to reducing waste, in particular circumstances where there is the deliberate shortening of a product's lifespan this planned obsolescence. In the context of improving consumers' awareness of the consumer guarantees, I also support the Productivity Commission's focus on the use of warranties by manufacturers to alter or avoid their obligation to repair uh, or refund a faulty good. I especially commend the Productivity Commission's considered approach on the challenges posed by the complex framework that currently exists in Australia regarding the protection of intellectual property and copyright laws. To this end, the ACT government supports reforms to Australia's copyright laws that would better facilitate the sharing of repair information and access to repair information behind digital blocks, uh, digital locks, sorry, where such a use would be fair. Uh, finally, I'd like to turn to an issue that I particularly have a passion for, and that is e-waste management. In my view, some of the behaviours that the Productivity Commission observes, such as deliberate shortening of the product's lifespan by manufacturing products that use solder that does not allow the product to be repaired, uh, refusing to supply component parts, or discontinuing software updates, uh, do need to be counted. And I'll come back to how I think we should do that. Planned obsolescence, of course, is a bizarre notion. Uh, it's one that I find particularly egregious in a world in which we face a series of crises, whether that's the extinction crisis, 
the climate crisis or the various other issues around water shortage and the like, where planned obsolescence essentially means more resource use and therefore greater depletion of the planetary resources that we all rely on. What's quite bizarre to think about is this has actually been going for some time. In some ways, it's a central part of business models. Uh, in preparing for today, we were sort of thinking about what's a good example of planned obsolescence that's been around for a little while. And one of my teams stumbled across a story around the fact that, around light bulbs. And I see well, at least one nod in the room, so I'm sure a few of you know this story, but um, it has been happening for well over 100 years because light bulb manufacturers actually put a lot of R&D effort into how to make light bulbs last for less time. Light bulbs actually last an incredibly long time and there is a light bulb that is still in, has been burning for 120 years. It's in California. You can watch a webcam of it, which does sound pretty boring, but is actually a, a fascinating story, the fact that this light bulb's been burning for 120 years. Because light bulbs actually last a really long time and they bizarrely put their R&D effort into how do we make them last less time so that we can sell more of them. Now, so this notion of planned obsolescence is not a new one, but a particularly perverse one. It is, of course, highly tempting to manufacturers for all the obvious reasons. I strongly believe it's an important consumer right to be able to tinker with products and to get them fixed and to overcome this notion of planned obsolescence and, and to put things back together. We support the Productivity recommend, Commission's recommendation to improve product labelling to increase consumers' awareness of the components of a good. We also strongly support changing product stewardship programs to include the counting of re recycled and repair goods in statistics. Such approaches will all have a combined impact of stemming the creation of product turnover and e-waste by extending product viability and lifespans. Now, as as was recently discussed at the OECD's Consumers in the Marketplace conference, it is increasingly clear that consumer guarantees, such as the right to repair, are being viewed internationally through the prism of the impact that the manufacturing of products is having on environmental degradation. And I'm really delighted to see that consumer advocacy groups are becoming increasingly vocal in pursuing the strengthening of consumer rights as a way of fostering a circular and greener economy in their respective countries. Now, I could sit here and talk to you about all sorts of terrible examples of e-waste. I suspect most of you are familiar with a lot of them. Uh, but it is a particular area of, of concern. And having made those positive comments about the findings of the Productivity Commission, I would do also want to offer a counter view. Uh, because I do have a concern that simply creating more consumer information doesn't actually tackle the root of the problem. We should empower consumers, and there's lots of consumers out there that want to do the right thing. There's no doubt about that. And there is people who will take the time and read all the labels and choose carefully. But the cold, hard reality is that we live in a very complex world, and an increasingly complex world, and a world where people are busy, they don't have the time. Uh, the reality is you know, we have issues of people not having necessarily the skills, the literacy to read those really complex labels. And so, we can't rely on consumer information being enough. The problems of e-waste and built-in obsolescence are in fact significant market failures. And so the market won't fix them. Information won't fix them, in my view. In my view, there is a clear role for government to be interventionist in this space and to require and regulate to overcome these inherent market failures. Because we see the motive is really clearly there and it's been there for a long time. And so I want to be careful in not being unduly critical of the Productivity Commission's work, because as I've indicated broadly, I think it's very good and I'm very supportive of it, but I don't think that market answers are sufficient. We need to take stronger steps, and government, as I said, has a clear role in addressing those market failures and actually making sure that we don't wait for the gradual improvement the planetary crises facing us don't have the time for the market to gradually get it right and for the consumers to gradually catch up, which is what will happen if we aren't more deliberate about it. And so I think there is a very specific role there. The Productivity Commission report provides an excellent starting point 
for that improved effort to address market failure. And I think they're the sort of things we can do reasonably quickly and sit within our existing frameworks of Australian consumer law uh, and the powers of the ACCC and various others to, to deliver. Unfortunately, the former federal government didn't show a great deal of interest in the Productivity Commission's report in the sense that there was no formal government response in the time left uh, up until the federal election, which, if I remember correctly, was probably about... Oh, I can't remember the number of months, but anyway, we didn't see the formal report, so it's sitting there, hopefully, in the entry of the new minister. And certainly, uh, I've already written to the new minister saying, have a look in your entry, there's this great report that you really should have a look at and start to respond to. But certainly, we have the next Consumer Affairs Minister's meeting in just a month's time, in early September, and uh, one of the key issues that the ACT is, is putting on the agenda there is to come back to this report, to have a discussion with my ministerial colleagues and to put this firmly on the radar of the incoming federal government. And I was very pleased to see my Canberra colleague, Andrew Lee, was here this morning. Unfortunately, I missed it, but I will catch up on the telecast later. Uh, but certainly to have some new ministers who I think will show an interest in this and there's some real opportunity here to say, let's start to pick some of these up because these are well thought through recommendations and ones that we should move forward quickly on in Australia to create that foundation that we can then build this nascent area of policy work into something with more strength, more muscle. Uh, and as we begin to develop it, we'll see how it can more clearly roll out in Australia. So I'm really delighted to see you all back here in Canberra this year. I'm delighted to see this conference taking place for a second time, uh, for the enthusiasm for this work. Uh, and I, for those of you who do have that opportunity, back in your home states and territories, do, if you have the chance, talk to your Consumer Affairs Minister and say to them, hey, there's a really good report there that we want you to get behind because there is a pathway there and your job now as Consumer Affairs Ministers is to get on and make sure this becomes part of Australian consumer law and part of uh, Commonwealth law where the Federal Government has their role to play. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about this today and I look forward to chatting to a few of you over lunch. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to hear your insights and we thank you again for your support over this um, right to repair journey.